It's really great to see everyone again. We're very grateful to kick off our first session with three wonderful guests. You all will hear more about their pathways into venture capital today, so I'll keep the intros short. Uh, but today we are lucky to be joined by Kent Bennett, um, who focuses on consumer investing at Vent Bessemer Venture Partners, Melody Ko, who is joining us virtually, uh, at, who is at NextView, investing in seed stage companies that are re redesigning the everyday economy. And last but not least, Alex Iskold, who founded 2048 to invest in pre-seed tech startups. So with that, I'll pass it over to Michael, who's gonna kick off our first breakout exercise. So first of all, really happy to see you all here. I have to say, I don't know why we've biased the room on this side, but doesn't matter. I think it's because it's closest to the food and the exit. Uh, but my challenge will be to keep you away from your food and definitely out of the exit. That said, I want to make sure that we start this off with a little bit of a level set because this is going to be recorded. And there are a number of, of people, as you know, about 100 people who couldn't join the class. And so we want to make sure they end up getting some of the benefit of this. And so thank you for bearing with me for a minute. So why are we doing this? We're doing this because as first years, we wanted to give you a chance to understand what is venture capital all about? Many of you have told us that you don't even know whether you should pursue a, a career in venture because you don't know enough about what venture is. And so that is the beginning of this session. And it's all about what is VC really? And why is it something that I might be interested in? Maybe it's not, and that's totally cool. But the point is, if it is, then we want to give you the tools to start engaging on all the great classes that exist at Harvard so that by the time you get to second year, you could even choose something like Jeff Buskang's class, the VC journey. So, with that said, today we've got three great guests, but I don't want this to be a lecture. I want this to be a session for you to engage on what you are interested in learning about venture. So right off the bat, I'm going to get you to work. So on the board uh, are your teams, and you're going to an alcove for each of you. And what I want you to do is go to the alcove in your teams of four. And if you're in any doubt about what your name is, we'll scroll through and find it for you electronically. And I want you to take a moment to just think about what do you know about venture? And then scribe out just up to 10 words that you think are the stages that are involved in venture from finding something to exiting something. And I'm purposely not giving you any more than that because I have no idea what you know. And so this is an opportunity for you to say, I know nothing. You might just write find and exit, in which case, We'll have to do a lot of guesswork today. Uh, but if you think you know what goes on between finding a deal and working it all the way through to getting an exit, put that down as succinctly as you can on the flip charts. And then I'm going to have you bring them all back here. And we're going to start talking to the experts in Kent and Alex and Melody to tell you what really happens. And we'll draw out for you whether it's something that you want to do. So go have some fun. Take your food if you want to. And we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes or so. So did you have fun doing that? Yeah. What, what were some of the surprises that came up for you when you sat down and started thinking about it? Like, oh, we know the answers to all this? No? Lewis? There's way more stuff to write than space. So 10 steps, I think, is not enough. Would you believe it if I said you could probably reduce it to about five or six? I think so, if I had more experience. Great. <laughs> what about other people? Any experience of what that was like? Like surprising you or, nah, this is obvious. It was tough to organize like what each of us knew about the process. Yeah. So it was like, okay, no, first you have to do this, no, first you have to do this. So that was something you know, a difficult to achieve. So you were challenged with just organizing it and trying to put it in some kind of structure, okay? Anybody else? Stella, how about you? I know you were scrib scribing away furiously at the end. Uh, I think we went more depth than breath, but I would say that there's just so met many avenues for each step, if you okay. will. Like so many ways to solve. Well, the, the good news is hopefully it's got you filled with questions. Does anybody in this room not have a question now about what VC is? Good, because I would have challenged you if you didn't. Um, and that's what we wanted to do, is we wanted to get you thinking about the kinds of things to ask our great guests this evening. So uh, I'll give Kent a chance to finish his food while he comes up. Uh, Alex and Melody, anything you observed while we're getting everybody settled? You were having to go around on a laptop, but you were very agile. I saw you there, Melody, navigating your group. I, I didn't do anything. 
anything, I feel like they got the answers. We can just wrap this up, you know. <laughs> Excellent. How about you, Alex? I look forward to the rest of the session and unpacking it all. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to admit to you we don't have an answer at all. I mean, we really don't, just to be super clear. If you ask 10 VCs, and you've only got three in the room, what they think is involved in VC, you would probably get 10 different answers. So I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, oh, there's an answer. This is what VC looks like A to Z. We can just process flow it and put it in you know, a diagramming tool. And next thing you know, we'll go through RPA, and that's it. We're done. Uh, unfortunately, it's not like that. It's a lot of why we wanted to make sure we expose this session. VC is as much an art as it is a science. And honestly, people prosecute it very differently depending on what stage they're in, what, for example, domains they work in, their own particular style. And there is no one style that works in VC, which is why we wanted to also encourage all of you, and those of you who will be watching, to consider VC. It's, it's a whole black box we want to make sure we blow up so that you can all feel it's much more accessible. We can attract a much more diverse group of people into VC, hopefully uh, expanding ultimately the talent that brings great innovation to the fore and gets it funded. So with that said, we came up with these steps. The sourcing, selecting, winning, investing, building, and exiting. Now, if you're wondering where the heck these steps came from, uh, I'll be blunt. They're just what I came up with after sitting in 12 years of meetings and watching $3.5 billion get invested. Doesn't mean to say it's right. It's just what I observed. And it just so happens that we run our firm this way, too. So, you know, we're eating our own cooking, if you will. But as I said, it's not an answer. It's just a framework. So now let's go around and see what you got. So Anna, Jack, Stella, and Akram, what did you think was involved in sourcing? You've got some great notes up here. I see conferences, cold calling. Uh, you put campuses up here, which is very cool. And then industry trends. Say more about industry trends. Uh, let's see, Stella. Oh, actually, I keep picking on Stella. How about Jack? Uh, sure. So I think, I think in addition to sourcing, the one thing that we kept coming back to is like before sourcing, you'd want to have uh, an investment thesis to inform like what types of companies you'd be nice. looking to get in touch with. So industry trends would be something that would inform that investment thesis and would even be sort of step zero, as uh, we put it. Awesome. OK, great. So uh, I'm going to go to another team. Inbound versus outbound. This is Alcove 118, Kat and Layla. Can you say a little bit more about what you thought was involved there? Why inbound versus outbound? Um, I it just could be two different approaches that firms use. Either people are coming to you asking for money and giving pitches, or I guess outbound, you could be reaching out within your network or watching different Y Combinator pitches and whatever's interesting to you, you're kind of reaching out to them um, as a potential prospect if it matches your thesis. Kent, do you do inbound and outbound, or is it just one, and what makes sense to you? Uh, very selective inbound from people I know yeah. uh, can work. I, 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 I respond to all the email and I get inbound, but I think over time, I, like many of my peers have found, I haven't found a great company to jump in the boat, um, that I get uh, referrals from people who know me for great companies, because great founders tend to come back to hyper-network very quickly and find people. Or I'm, I've done the research and I'm very targeted, and I reach out to a company that's doing something very specific, that the odds that they get to me before I get to them are very low if I'm on a thesis. OK, so that's just one person's. We'll, we'll just try at the, at the back with Alex and, and uh, Melody. Do either of you do outbound or inbound in a particular targeted way? We definitely do not have a muscle in the outbound. We're literally day zero, super pre-seed. So we, we, what we do do is we, we do develop thesis, but it's, it's, it's a struggle for us to do outbound. So we we definitely much more we're thesis driven but we're uh mostly inbound okay great uh melody any different view we're probably the half the stuff we do we can be the same round as alex so like pre c and concept stage and probably half of the stuff we do we can overlap with ken at the his earlier end of the spectrum so post launch or you know early traction seed but um i would say that um the the type of outbound I put in quotes because it's more like talent outbound as opposed to company outbound. Um, you know, as a seed investor, I mean, this, these markets are like forming as we speak. So I'm just not smart enough to do the best from style. Like here is like the market and the roadmap. I find like here, you know, this company looks like this. We're mainly relying on, you know, 
do we believe the founder have a unique point of view on the market? And then do we think that market is interesting? And if those two things are yes, then that's an interesting company for us. Nugget, huge nugget you just heard there. So uh, I will leave you to, to pontificate for yourself of what you think that is all about. But talent outbound, identifying somebody who really knows a market is a wonderful way to get to understand whether there's a potential there. Even if you don't know anything about it, if you can identify an expert in a marketplace, and they've got an idea or they've got a, a view about what it is that's missing in a market, it's a wonderful starting point. So thank you all. That was all great input. No right answers again. They're just different approaches you can use. All right, so we've done enough on sourcing. Let's go down to selecting. This sounds like it's such an easy thing to do, but it's not that easy, and here's why. We have a very, very big challenge when you look at the numbers. So, Kent, just tell me roughly, how many deals do you see a year? Uh, the word see is a little bit like I'm going to Bill Clinton that word and say, okay, <laughs> um, there are 10,000 deals that probably hit a structure that could hit me. Yep. Um, and I've probably become aware personally of 2,000 of them. <laughs> yep. You know, yeah, that's like me reading a sentence. Yep. And then I probably meet with uh, 300 of them a okay. year. Yeah. And how many do you do a year? How many Three. do you actually select to do? Three. Three. Three or four. Alex, how many do you see and how many do you invest in? We see four to 5,000 a year. Um, we meet with um, like 600 to 700 and then we do I personally do probably eight to 10 deals a year and the firm overall does uh, 20 to 25. Very good. Melody, what are your numbers? Just using like personal numbers, like 300 meetings. I, I probably personally do two to four investments a year. Okay. So what are you all taking away from this? Is this selection piece at all important? Or can you just invest in everything you see? There's some smiling, but there's no hands going up. Walter, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think this is a really hard process to, to narrow it down. I think it's kind of a black box to me still right now in terms of what you actually do to kind of narrow it all the way down to just the couple that you want to choose. <laughs> okay, so this group here, I didn't see anything uh, on the selection piece. Here I saw went diligence screening. So this is interesting. This is John Walter, Anushka, Sarah, and Scott. So you're right there. But I'm going to tell you something that, that isn't on your chart, which is that this is separate. Because would you really want to do diligence on 24,000 opportunities? No, you'd be dead. So you actually have to get filtering and selecting way before you get digging in too much to diligence. Now, by the way, it can be very iterative. As you just heard Kent explain, you really don't want to do too much of that because if you're going to meet with 300 people, that's where you need to put your time and attention to get down to the next lot. So uh, did any team have a particular idea about how they do selecting? Julius. Yeah, um, we were thinking a little, one of the things we put on our sheet is strategy map. So yep. it could be like a market map, so to speak. So if you kind of think about the areas of the universe that you could invest and then yep. kind of drill into that and then find the best companies in that industry, maybe that could um, take you from those 10,000 that you learn about to the 300 meetings that you see to eventually looking for the winner in the market that you want to have the meeting with. Great. And by the way, this is very similar to thesis too. So, you know, you just heard a couple of people raise this idea of, okay, if we have a thesis or a strategy map, then things that come to us, if they don't fall in it, you just rule them out. That can be a good idea. Is it always a good idea, Ken? Ter no, it can be a terrible idea at times because what, what I like to say is we have a thesis, and so if a company matches our thesis, we're gonna do more work. We're gonna take a meeting or, or ask a question before we take a meeting. Um, if it's totally off of our thesis, but we have a sign that it is really working. So, so if it's pre-launch off our thesis, we don't know anything about it, that's not for us. If it's totally off our thesis, doesn't match our thesis, but wow, the business is really performing even at a very early stage, and I think the signals of that can emerge very quickly. Then I think we want to urgently ask ourselves the question, are we missing something? Does this actually fit a thesis that we have, that it, but it's disguised? 
you know, there's, there's like a, because it, the, the biggest sin we can commit is, this, is the false, you know, negative, is the passing on Datadog as I did in the series seed and A and B. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're I just, just love this guy, yeah, by the way, right? <laughs> because there aren't enough VCs who do what Vesma does, which is actually honestly tell you that stuff. It's really important. I gave it a lot from the A, but I lost. But anyway, yeah. my former associate won it. Uh, anyway, uh, so, that's so, in, so that's in the win <laughs> column. We're, we're going to come that's back what, to that in a second. It. We're going to talk about that. What um, happened there? But yeah, so I, I, I think it's, it, we are, I, and, and uh, my fellow guests could disagree, but I think we are searching for these incredibly rare bolts of lightning. Yep. And so you can search with a thesis, but if you hear a thunder crash next to you, you better run over there and figure out what the hell is going on. Maybe it was just a false thing, but um, we have to pay attention. So, yeah, in the back. I think probably this is why, like, return founders get funded so much more often is because once you kind of have, like, a track record of being a founder that has exited or substantially done some work, then you probably can come back to, you know, VCs and really have that relationship. So probably that's another reason. So you pontificate that if you've been a successful founder before, you should get funded again. Not even successful, but I think like if you've been a founder before, I think you're top of the funnel. But if you've been a successful one, probably you're getting more top of the funnel. Yeah, so Zuckerberg wouldn't have got a look from you, or nor would the founders of Airbnb, or nor would the eBay founders. No, I'm sure. I'm sure that. I'm just I'm teasing because I want to make a point here, which is um, maybe Melody, you could just tell us an example of a founder you've backed that had no track record. A lot of the founders I work with are first time founders, but that, I mean, you know, back to like kind of three things I think about at C stage, the team, the market, the product, half the time product's not built. So we can't even look at that. And then you just look at the team and the market. So if you are a first time founder, we're looking for signals of like excellence and, and, and what something that you've done previously because being a founder is really freaking hard and <laughs> you're, you run through walls. And so I think you just need to be exceptional individuals. And then the other thing, you know, we think a lot about is what we call founder market fit. Why is this team uniquely positioned to tackle this particular market? Because again, the success rate is so low that you ideally want to have a team that has a higher probability of success armed with whatever, right? Relationship, Go to market wedge, you know, insights that are unique and, and that can give them a different take on how to execute. Great. Alex, what is a question you would want this group to be thinking about to help them select a great investment? What does the future look like? Awesome. Okay. Why is that question important? You're asking a founder, you're trying to figure out out of the, you know, uh, 10,000 that you're going to see this year and you ask them, what does the future look like? Why is that a good question? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. So like here's he her ability to like analyze trends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. So can they analyze trends? Go ahead, Mark. I just think having a plan is as important as like the quality of the plan, which can be hard to understand. But if you have a plan, at least it gives you something to deviate from. So you're thinking plan, vision, one and the same thing? Anybody else think that's the same or different? Yep, go ahead. Uh, I think it's more about the vision, because if you can foresee where the future of the customer base needs are, then no matter how many times you pivot, if you have your eye on that goal, continuing to work towards that same thing. So I think it's, does your understanding of the market and the future of what's needed in that space match up to what the VC sees, or can you provide a unique insight that the VC hasn't thought of before? Yeah, and I, I think just to give Melody the credit for raising it, one of the key things we invest in is a market. So if somebody doesn't have a vision of the market, how are you going to get going, you know, investing behind them? Now, have you ever invested in a founder had no vision? No, they've always had some initial idea. For us, I think it's very important to have not just a, like a very specific product vision is because yeah. is, that, if we're going to match a thesis to it. Yeah. There are a couple of times Melody was involved with one. We've invested in... Uh, one of our associates who was just a superstar, he had an idea, we didn't like it, but we said, let's give Matt some money, he'll probably figure something out. And he pivoted and found a Blue Apron um, months later after we invested. But for the most part, we are very tight on product vision. So what's also awesome about this conversation, by the way, I told you there are no answers, 
and nobody has the same answer either. So Kent just brought up an incredibly important point, which we haven't raised, and amazingly, I haven't seen it on any sheet here, and it's critical in the selection process. It is on the board, but what are we missing that's absolutely critical? It's been touched on already in the selection process. You just heard a little bit of it, a story from Kent about how he backed Matt. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Senem. I think it's winning the founders, like building relationships with them. So even if you want to invest in them, they, you want to make sure that they also want to work with you. So that's a great point in the winning column. Definitely agree. You want to build relationships with the founders. But what is, a, what is it in the selecting piece that's important here? Anna. It could be different, but like what else are the competitors doing? Like, I think going back to your understanding of the market, yep. just having like a broader view. Okay. Yep, that's important too. Um, oftentimes, I could check in with any of my guests here. Competition is a function of what we might evaluate in diligence, but we're talking about selecting first. Go ahead, Leila. Um, kind of to Senem's point, but a little bit earlier, is capitalizing on your existing relationships. Yep. Where would that help you? In the sourcing, the selecting, or the winning, or? I guess it's pseudo-sourcing and selecting. Say more about how it'd help you in the selecting. Um, if it's somebody that you're, like in his case, he already had a track record, already understood the person, like fundamentally had worked with him, like had strong relationship capital and that they believed in him and knew how he thought in, in a very intimate way. So there's like trust that's built there. We're on the edge of a breakthrough here. <laughs> and um, it is one of the critical things. You've already heard that it's one of the three things. Go ahead, Radhika. Is it like the founder's credibility? Say more. Like, what, like how credible have they been in their earlier, if they are already a repeat founder, or even if they work with you know, someone in the VC fund, like what, what has their credibility been this far? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, sir. You have to have incredibly high conviction on the founder, less, I mean, in the early stage, less so on the idea, because they're going to have to pivot and be really flexible. Yes! Yes, absolutely. I can tell you, without even asking Kent this, that if he didn't like the founder or didn't believe in them, it wouldn't matter how much vision they had. But I just heard the opposite from him, which is that Matt didn't have a vision, but you liked him enough. You had conviction in him. So was, how does better than play? He had a bad vision. Bad vision. <laughs> but we liked him. Yeah. So this is super important. It's really, you know, we're, we're talking about founders, but it's people. And um, Melody, thank you for bringing it up uh, earlier. Honestly, one of the number one things I'll hear almost consistently, because we all obviously work together, is what do we think of the founder? What do we think of the team? What do we think is the basis to invest in them? What would be the attributes that you'd look for, Kent, when you're picking out a founder? Um, and I think over time, by the way, I've gotten more nervous about evaluating a founder, right? Because what the hell do I know? And, and, I, and I, I, I was very close to investing in a fraudulent sociopath over the last couple of years. Um, but the common attribute is, you know, insane intensity of purpose, like they have to do it. Yep. So often their backstory involved, you know, them selling candy bars in high school because they figured out they could arbitrage the Costco thing and they started a tutoring business. And they, I mean, the number of founders I've worked with who've started a tutoring business in high school is like insane. Um, so you just see that pattern of like Energizer Bunny just just have to do it. Yep. Not always though. I mean, there are, we've found some laid back founders. Again, I think we're looking for these bolts of lightning and sometimes very smart, but maybe not crazy driven yep. people yep. sort of bump into them yep. and then they're happening. Yep. And then they're like, what do you think of this? And you're like, oh. You know, so, it's, so I don't really have like a, this founder doesn't match my exact profile, I won't do it. Um, it especially if the thesis is met. Well, what I love about what you're sharing in general is you don't, put things in boxes and you don't try to say that this is a straight jacket that somebody has to fit into. I mean, what kills me, by the way, is when people need the founder's bio to have a certain brand on it or like that is, I think, total garbage because yeah. we have founders who've come from, you know, first time company come from really random places and do great things. Yeah. You're hearing one of the most important skills, by the way, that a VC needs. So we're in the selecting column. What is it that is a skill you need or an attribute? that you're gonna to need to be a good VC. Go ahead, Julius. Is it pattern recognition? Pattern matching, yeah, pattern. Is that where you're going? It's certainly one of them. I think you were showing that and something else. So this is one of the things you, you're gonna get good at as a VC. This, yeah, go ahead. Judgment. Yes, that's actually the word I was looking for. I know you have it, so. I mean, um, you hope, but. 
<laughs> what so, is it? <laughs> Alex, just to bring you on on this, I know you're, we, we're lucky enough to work with Alex. We invested in his fund just to be transparent about it. We think he's an awesome guy. We took a bet on Alex before he even started his fund because we just believe he's an awesome dude. But he, he's making judgments every day. We have gone through and analyzed our entire portfolio and founders in an attempt to distill the interesting signals and what DNA is truly um, a DNA of a winning founder. We know it's impossible, but there's some really interesting signals and I'll just share a couple. So uh, Kent and I share an investment uh, in a company that's run by an identical twin. And I have identical twins. And so I got very curious about this. And after going down the rabbit hole, I've computed to something that I think is a thing. Uh, identical twins are ultra competitive. So think about competitive athletes. Many of you are super, super competitive people because of where you got to in life. But think ultra competitive. Why? Because there is a person next to you that looks like you, that wants to be you, that you need to distinguish yourself from, that you compete hard every day. And so I'll give you that one trait. Melody, I want to bring you in for a second just to say before we wrap up on selecting. You did a fantastic job of summarizing what you think was involved. You give us three steps, which was the founder, the market, and I've forgotten what the third one was. The product. Product, yeah, thank you. What have we missed in selecting before we moved on? The, well, the only other thing I'll add is um, y y usually the first step of selecting slash doing work is you take a first meeting. And I, I tell all the founders in our portfolio that, you know, when they deal with talking to, you know, Series A investors later on, uh, most investors, I think they know whether they want to pass or they want to continue. 15 minutes in. So, um, and then within that, a lot of times a good conversation, a good first meeting is something that I feel like I learned a really unique insight about a market. I was like, oh, I never thought about that. Or, right. oh, I did not know that. That, and, and that kind of conversation is very interesting and unique. Not a hundred percent of those get to investment, but enough of those are very interesting that let you dig deeper because that talks about kind of both the quality of the team and their ability to articulate their unique point of view and like whether that unique point of view has has legs in terms of attacking that market. So I, I'm just going to leave that comment because I think that's kind of how I think a lot about first meetings and what I want to get out of first meetings and the signals I want to continue versus pass. And what a great example of where you're doing that, you're hearing that insight and you're making a judgment, should I continue or not? Is there anything else that goes into your judgment? Because you're not doing diligence at that point. It's not like you've got a calculator out and started doing the market size. I mean, it's really just, it's, it, this is why like this job is really hard because it's all very qualitative. Um, I tend to just, ju I, I throw a bunch of questions at, at the founder and I kind of compute the quality of the answers coming back, if that makes sense. Yep. And, and I asked about go to market. I asked how, what kind of, how do they think about building the product? I think who's your ICP? How do you think about XYZ pricing? Da, da, da. And a lot of times I'm not really interested in the current state of the answer because that would change, but it's about how the team thinks about approaching that question and, and approach how, and then that, that gives you some signals of how they might iterate through the building journey. And what's the probability of them getting to product market fit and, and building a really large company beyond that? So this is a very important part of our business is that we have to, at some stage, form on the fly sometimes a thesis about why this founder with this product and this opportunity is radically going to create some product market fit. For me, and, and Melody sort of hit part of it, the, you hear people talk about founders who have a secret. Yeah. Um, and that's the insight into a market. For me, the next point is, can they leverage that secret to a product advantage, even if it's theoretical pre-launch? That is pretty obvious. Yep. And so if you look back at the history of every you know, great investment in, at Bessemer, and sometimes you, you do this in a revisionist way, but the product was just meaningfully better than the legacy standard quote. Like, 
and what is meaningful? Well, that it gets a little subjective, but like it's some version of if you show it to a qualified lead, they say, "Holy crap, I need that." You know, when's it available? Yeah. Um, and so, I you get all it's, there's a lot of noise in these early conversations yep. that can distract you from like that edge. And again, sometimes some people invest before somebody has that edge. I actually don't think over large data sets, VC's track record of investing before there's that edge yep. identified is very good. Yep. Um, so I, for me, this selection is all about radical product market fit. It's not product. Everybody has product market fit. The bagel shop down the street from me has product market fit. They yep. do. They do fine. But like, you know, holographic bagel, bagels, you know, into your home, that'd be a terrible idea. But like, yep. it's got to be something like that. Like, oh my God, that'd be incredible, right? It's Uber versus taxis. Oh my God, right? Yep. So that for me is the biggest thing. In the stage that Alex is at, often there's just an idea. So how do you invest in the future, Alex? I think that the starting point for that is founder needs to be um, exceptionally clear and obsessed with what the future is going to look like five, seven years from now. Articulating that true north is literally, this is sort of my, my second question. I ask two first questions. One is what's the origin story? And the second question is what does the world look like five, seven years from now? I am at a pre-seed, you cannot be a why not investor. There's no such thing. You make no money because I can take any company and explain to you why thousand times over, you should not write a check. So the only way you can be a pre-seed investor is if you're a what if investor, which is what I am. It's pretty irrational, but there is a, there's math and there's a system. And impossible to make an investment unless the founder can really articulate that massive true north. If you don't know where you're going, how will you get there? How will you inspire people? How will you recruit? How will you raise? You can't. So that vision, and it needs to be obsessively detailed as a, as a massive prerequisite for us. So I, I want to thank Alex and Melody and Kent for bringing this into focus. I'll bring it together for you in one simple circle, which is if you can find a founder who uniquely understands their market because they've been in it for long enough and they identify this radical product advance that is a customer need that they can show you they've built something for as a product that just had never been done before and it's a huge breakthrough. I'll bet you you're going to write a check. That is basically what we all do all the time. But it sounds easy. It's really not when you, for example, are sometimes investing in the future, it hasn't been invented, or sometimes there's pieces of it that are completely missing, including you don't even believe in the thesis, but you believe enough in the founder, or you believe enough in the potential of a market. So this is why judgment is one of the most important skills. But then patent matching really helps, by the way, because if you've seen it happen enough times, you get to say, okay, I realize this kind of founder going after this kind of market with this kind of background is going to nail this. And you make your investment. My most successful investments have been exactly that. All right, so you've decided the investment you want to make. And you all, I just went and checked, put diligence on your list. Harvard is going to make you excellent at diligence. All the people that we're lucky enough to have recruited or I've worked with from Harvard in diligence, you get A pluses. If you're really good at diligence, how might that apply going backwards a little bit into selecting? Gaspar. I think that doing that diligence during the selecting process can help you, like, you know, understand if there's anything wrong with the company before you keep going with the founder. Yeah, so Sua will step in and say, hey, there's no business model here. And look at the graveyard of 22 companies I just found that have lost money in this space that never made it. The reason I point that out is because actually the skills you are learning at Harvard are incredibly important. And they are incredibly valuable, actually, in the early stages of joining a venture firm. So that's why we have associates and principals and people who don't have necessarily backgrounds in these things. Because you can ask questions that make us think, like, wow, I never thought of that. Ken, can you think of an example where somebody's you know, turned over your thesis in your, on your team and, and how do you kind of work with diligence in that? Well, not to brag, but uh, in our firm, we have total autonomy, so we can do whatever we want. But, um, but, but what that means is <clears throat> our partners are not shy and so, and often will share very negative opinions on the things, like just like, I hate this. And what happens was when things are really working early yeah. stage, the human brain wants to tell you all the ways it's going to fail, yeah. you know, 
Um, alternatively, when things are not working, the human brain like wants to tell you like, but just around the corner is this thing that's gonna happen. So, you know, almost every great investment I've ever brought in, I've showed it to my partners with the knowledge that I could do whatever I want, and they all hate it. I mean, every, uh, you know, at least half the crowd, and of course, that's the only half I hear is the half telling me I'm stupid, um, says, don't do this. This is the worst thing you've ever seen. Yeah. Which, by the way, I think is a fantastic way to approach things. So, again, no right way, no wrong way. And in the end, we're always big believers. We say the same thing in the end, by the way. Anybody can get any deal done. Nobody can lie on the track. So we do have the same thing. But we encourage people, particularly it's how we bring multi-generational partners along, is to give them the chance to challenge like crazy in the diligence. And so as you think about what job you want to take, if you're getting into VC, this is one of the best things you can do is you can say, hey, look, we could be great even when, you know, Kent or uh, Melody or Alex have got a great idea. We could be great at doing the diligence, running alongside you and figuring out what you might be missing. Doesn't mean to say it'll change his mind or my mind or whatever, but it may advise us, oh, we're missing this team member or we need to put this, uh, de-risk this part of the product or validate this kind of business model, et cetera. And that's stuff you're all very good at, or you will be by the time you graduate for sure. Okay, we, we really do need to focus on winning. Sorry, is there a question? Yep. Um, as you're having these debates, what yep. does the resolution look like? Like, how do you get to the moment of like, okay, now we're going to pull the trigger one way or the other? Melody, what's it like inside next view? The quick summary is we, you know, individual partners kind of run their own funnel. So like sourcing and talking in our own heads and doing work. And we use team meetings to get initial feedback where we call blink votes. So Rob would be like, oh, I hate this. Dave would be like, oh, you should ask this question. And then I go back and digest and I figure out whether I want to continue to do more work. At some point I decide to have enough conviction to bring the founder in to pitch the entire team. And then after that, we call, we, we have a discussion and we call the final vote. And then Rob would be like, oh, I don't hate it as much anymore. And then oh. David says, oh, no, I really like it. And then we, we express our opinions in a very specific way. But um, our decision style is conviction-based, which means individual partners can um, decide to invest with conviction, even though everybody else hates it. Uh, but we, we frame our voting in a way that's more, very much around gathering feedback. So to answer your question very specifically, after that final pitch, I hear everybody either like it or not like it for whatever reason. And then I go digest and I have to live by my own decision. And then I would, you know, update the team on Slack. It's like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to issue a term sheet and blah, 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 deal dynamics, such and such. People have feedback. And then I go and do that. And then, you know, I guess it's a good segue into the, the winning section of the, the actual, how do you actually win a deal? But that's kind of how we, how we run things. So it's a great question, Anna, and it's also a question I encourage you to ask the firms that you're going to interview at, because it'll tell you a lot about their culture. I think most of the great firms have in some form or another got good enough partners that they trust them to make the decisions. And they also have a culture where everybody listens to each other. Like you want to hear your partners, I, I was glad you said it, tell you all the things that could go wrong before you find out too late. Right. Much better than due diligence that I've And, and right? by the way, in that process, when they're telling you what could go wrong, if they bring up something I haven't thought of, then awesome. I'm really floored by it, and I'm, and I'm shamed, and I really will think and process it. Yeah. A lot of that is like, yeah, yeah, I thought about that, but you know, I think the restaurant industry is big enough, you know, yeah. whatever it is. But. My personal trick, by the way, is a simple one, which is I assume that I'm about to write the last check out of my bank balance because it should be that important to you. You should have that much conviction in it that you would write that last check, and you'd say, this is what I really believe is going to make a 10x or beyond, hopefully 100,000x even but I've got so, so much conviction that my own money would go behind this. By the way, I just had an example the other day where my firm did not get behind something, but I wrote a personal check. And it wasn't my investment, which is interesting. So in other words, the, the partner who was running with it decided not to run with it. I was like, cool, she decided not to, that's totally fine. And we all agreed, it's okay, I'll write a personal check. Small personal check, by the way. But the point is, you should have that level of conviction. And that takes time, pattern matching, and all the other things we've talked about. Okay, great, good news. You found the investment you want to make. Are you guaranteed to get that investment? How many other venture firms out there? Ken, how many roughly venture firms do you compete with on average? Uh, I mean, there's a list of at least 100 names that will show up consistently all the time, but there's, I don't know, 1,000 plus firms of some shape or another. Yeah. Uh, any examples of where you've lost the deal, Alex or Melody? You wished you'd done that deal. I, we've already heard the Datadog story. I was appreciative that Ken brought one up. Pretty much 
I've never seen people win uh, deals if they are bidding lower. So we we are very disciplined on the valuation and certainly if it's a little bit of a delta, you're flexible, but uh, you know, there's no chance or very little chance I'd be entering at like 30 posts in the, in the pre-seed. Like, I, I don't want to say never, but like pretty much never. So you brought up one question, which was, so one reason you might win or not is valuation. Hands up who thinks that's important. Okay, anybody who didn't, so let's see. Anushka, uh, or Stella, since you raised your hand, go ahead. Yeah. The valuation's always wrong at the end of the day. And so it's more just like, do you think it's going to be a big deal? And that's very qualitative. Such an interesting point. Who else agrees with, with Stella? It's, not, it's never going to be a perfect valuation, especially if this has never been built before. Eric? Since you're looking at, <clears throat> sorry, for like outliers in your portfolio, yeah. like huge outliers, yeah. like 10x or 20x, like if you invest like at a premium of 40%, does it make like any difference? Right, I'm really, I'm really liking where this is going. Anybody else want to uh, time in? Jack? Um, I agree that the valuation's never right, like at that moment, like perfectly valuing the company in the ways that like we see in our finance class. Yeah. But it's definitely wrong if you don't win the deal. So there's the balance between like wanting to win the deal and then, you know, properly quote unquote valuing the company at that point in time. And particularly at this pre-seed and seed stage, it's primarily a function of like amount of capital and sort of like how many people are interested in you know, how, how much leverage the founder has at that, that point. So. so just for time's sakes, I'm going to cap this conversation and give Kent a chance to say, how important is valuation um, in winning the deal? In winning the deal, it's important. It's a, we, can, we can win a deal if we're not the highest price, but we have to be in the zip code. Um, and, you know, and often, if I, it's so rare that I want to win a deal. You know, those three times a year, okay, for a 20% valuation gap on a Series A company, am I really not going to get there? And, and, and then, frankly, like, I think to, I'll take Stella's point, I try to get the best price I can. If I think it's one of the, if a foundational next generation company, I will have a nice poker face, but I'm going to pay the price, whatever, whatever it is, up to some level of insanity, of course, but, like, I'm a price taker. So thank you. That was a great conversation. And by the way, Stella, such a good point you made. I know one venture firm whose name I won't, because I'll bring them on, I'll get them on as a guest, who will tell you that they want to be in every single category making or groundbreaking deal at whatever price. And they sometimes pay crazy prices. They paid $100 million for a company that basically didn't even have a product out the gate because they believed the founder had the right understanding of this particular category. But what else wins? I saw all of you writing things about, again, negotiation, I saw valuation and term sheet. Are those things that win you a deal? Um, I think the amount of equity that the firm is going to take because the founder presumably wants to have a sizable ownership stake as well. Yep. So there's important parts of the terms that are like, for example, how much the founder own of this? If you crush them down, you're not giving them enough incentive to invest their life in it. Yep. Great point. What else might help you win? John. I, I think it's the amount of value that you can add to the founder, or if the founder wants a fund that's hands off, being willing to say, I'll give you a check, but I will be hands off. It's basically being able to build the relationship with the founder, but then also kind of creating a relationship where you're adding value or you're doing something that they're specifically wanting to get out of the fund. Fabulous. I, I would love to have you in any of my pitches. Because honestly, that's exactly what founders are looking for. They can get capital anywhere. There is hundreds of billions of dollars sitting on the sidelines trying to get into venture, into venture deals. So we all know that capital is a commodity, right? Um, Alex, tell me you feel differently and, and uh, I'll be happy to disinvest from your fund. I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, we all know capital is a commodity. So what is the value add? Alex, what do you think is a good example of value add that always helps you win? Well, I, I think we have epic track record working with founders in the early stage that's commemorated in pages and pages of love and founders talking about how we're helpful. The challenge is during the investment process, we're trying to show 
uh, the founders who we are as we're evaluating them. And we're trying to be very deliberate and systematic about making sure it's a two-way street and them getting to know us while moving million miles an hour to make sure we get to the finish line quickly. So a lot of it is an internal know-how about how do we build the relationship in a way that reveals who we are. And then if they like who we are and they want to work with us, then, then we win at the end. So I, I don't want to embarrass Alex, but he has a fantastic track record of working with founders. He came through Techstars and he showed it by helping nurture them basically through what was in many instances just a very early stage journey before they could even find themselves a product, let alone you know, find product market fit. And so that's why founders work with Alex. They love working with him. He's shown himself for years before to be somebody who's going to not just bring money, but actually coach them through the process. And yet you also heard him do something very interesting there, which is he's willing to, at the same time as he's doing that, assess the founder and check whether this is a two-way street, as he put it. So that's a real skill too. So some of you put up negotiation. I will tell you, if you win a deal based on negotiating, uh, that's kind of the last resort. Like really, you don't want to be at that level. You want to win the deal because your reputation is so great. They've decided they want to work with you. You're in the zip code to the point that Kent made. But really what they've decided is that they'd like to work with you above and beyond everybody else. It's not always going to work out that way, but that would be ideal. So, yeah, go ahead, Annie. How do you get started? How do you build that network and that brand? I mean, I think it's easy once you're kind of established, but it sounds like a lot of it is based on your personal track record. I'm going to let you answer your own question. What do you think would be the best way to get started in that regard? You said something right off the bat, your track record. Yeah, it's based on your track record, but you have to start somewhere. So I guess you're just starting with building a network and seeing what deals you can get and then showing your performance based off of that? Yeah, and so I'm going to put it right up here because it's one of the critical things that you can't avoid in VC, which is it works right across this whole thing, but it starts at sourcing, which is you've got to be an unbelievably great networker. How many of you have watched the podcast that I want to thank Kinu for uh, editing so well? Who's watched it? Faith, what did you learn from that? What did he say about it? Two breakfasts, two lunches, two dinners. That's it? Yeah, pathological networker. That was the number one thing he said he recommended a VC have two lunches, two dinners, two breakfasts, and that they'd be a pathological networker. Now, I'm not going to say that, by the way, uh, Paul Mader is the answer to everything. Just like I told you, every VC is going to have a different thing. But I will tell you, that's how I would start, Annie. Go ahead. Follow up question. Do you have to continue that for your entire career? Or is it? <laughs> yeah, there's a reason I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> Once you establish a brand, can you leverage that one? Um, well, let me say it's somebody who's got a brand. Melody. How's your brand working for you? You still having two breakfast, lunch, and dinners? You're always hustling. That's, that's what you do. And what about you, Alex? In the spirit of whiplash, I rarely get out of my basement. <laughs> so I, 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 um, I think I build my reputation by investing 110% of my energy into founders. And then eventually the product speaks for itself. That, that said, it is true I have a gargantuan network, but I don't do it through lunches and dinners. I basically met most people through, through the founders that I spent time with. And that's what I love about this business. There isn't a right answer. So you heard inbound here again, and that's Alex's style. It works really well for him. I also know people, by the way, who hate networking, who are particularly sought after because they've focused in on one particular area and they've become absolutely superb at investing in it. So, I mean, I, I won't pick on anybody by saying it, but like if you decide to be an expert in commerce, it's an area, for example, I really dug into, then people eventually come to you to answer your question, Annie, and say, oh, you did this commerce deal and you did that commerce deal. And look, they both made billions of dollars and gosh, you have the full network on it. And in fact, that's exactly how my third commerce deal happened. I didn't go anywhere near a breakfast or a lunch. And the founders came to me and sat me down before they even started the company and said, shall we work through this idea with you? It's like, sure. So it, it's, it does build on itself. OK, one last thing on winning um, before we move on. Kent, what's an example of a deal you so nearly lost, but you finally got over the line? And what was it that made you get it over the line? Hmm. I'm, I'm pretty much, I, I lose them bad or I, or I win them. Um, I'm trying to think of when it's really close. 
Or, or pick a lose and bad if you want to, and which, what you wish you'd known that you could have got that deal with. Well, when, in Datadog was early in my career, and I did not ask them a very, and they went with an awesome uh, investor. So it could have been that simple, but I also didn't ask them what they wanted. Yeah. Um, and so I gave them a term sheet. I told them all the great things about Bessemer and, you know, but, but uh, they really wanted somebody on their board who had operating experience at the time. And so they, they went with a uh, firm that had a great operator who had uh, unbelievably relevant experience. If I had known that that was their goal on, on their director, I could have come forward with a package that would have been more competitive. And so that's now, even in diligence, by the way, I think winning starts in diligence. Like, how do you conduct yourself as you're getting to know the company? And do you, you know, do you come with a thesis? So you actually start on slide 18, as opposed to having to ask, like, what market is this? Um, you know, that they'll know that you'll be effective on the board. And then, and how, are you a jerk? Or are you, like, really easy to work with and focused on things that matter? And then what do they want to accomplish? And what are they trying to do with this fundraising? Just sort of, like, understanding their needs um, is, is now what I would do 10 years later. Okay, so I, I am so glad that you said it, because I was going to have to bring it up otherwise. We don't think you should have to win a deal at the end. We think exactly like Kent does, that the best way to do this is, you saw this word relationship with the founder. That starts the minute you meet them. And if you build the right relationship with them, guess what? You don't have to win the deal. We talk about it. We don't even have this step at underscore. We call it being selected. If the founder doesn't select us, we, ask, we look at ourselves and go, well, we failed. We shouldn't have to be negotiating to get them to, you know, to work with us. They just didn't believe in us as the people that could really help them. We didn't deserve to win it. So the biggest capital you have as a VC is not money. It's relationship capital. That's the one thing I hope you walk away with in the winning stage. If you've built a great relationship, your relationship capital is going to win you the deal, not your bank, bank, bank balance. And it takes all the things we've been talking about, networking, during the diligence, as Alex and, and Melody have given you a clue to it, and then as Kent just put a perfect final uh, point on it, it's how do you build that all the way through to the point where, of course, you're the obvious choice. You get selected. All right. That's winning. Now, I've got great news for you. You might think we're running out of time, but I'm about to just give you an absolute bypass on the next one. I looked at your sheets. You all have some sense of what's involved in investing, but I am not the person who's going to teach you this. You are at the best business school on the planet, in my opinion, to learn this piece. There are fantastic courses out there that you're going to go through over the next couple of years that will teach you how to be a great investor in this slot like doing all the things that will enable you to figure out what the right terms are and what the basis for negotiating the term sheet is, et cetera. We're not going to spend any time on it. So I'll happily come back in a couple of years' time as you're all graduating and check that you, you got the answers you wanted. We can talk more about it. But you'll probably learn things I don't even know about today. I didn't go to HBS. I wasn't smart enough. So In the entrepreneurial management course, um, the entrepreneurial manager, you guys are going to start covering it in RC here, and then you'll have more courses during the as well. So TAM is one of them, but there's plenty of others. Um, and what I would recommend is, if you decide VC is for you, that's what this is all about, then go take all those courses. Because you certainly want to know how to do this. This is definitely a skill set, and there's no way you want to skip it. Because you can actually get caught out. I've actually been in a deal where we should have been the full-on winner, but one clause in it, which I'll give you so you can always look out for it, which was called the pay to pay clause. We couldn't write the last check. They could, they were a much bigger fund. So they crushed everybody else that went before them and took all the winnings. Big lesson very early on in my, my career. Very, very awkward. You just wouldn't know to look for it if you didn't take the time to learn all the investing skills. So anyway, it's just a tiny example of why that's a, an important thing to learn about. This was before I became a VC and before I learned all the things that you need to look out for. OK, let's go to the fun part. And I have a question here before we go any further. So what do you guys think is involved in building? Does any team have building as one of their steps? Did you put it in what's involved in being a VC? So I see, I see advice. Alcove 118, Kat and Layla, what do you think was 
involved in advice. You put board connections, ops, synergies uh, within portfolios. Layla, go ahead. Um, I think this is one of my larger questions about how different VCs operate, right? Do they take an active role? Are they really looking for a board seat, high level strategic vice? Are they a strategic operating partner? Yeah. Are they coming in with some level of expertise or are they just bringing in experts if the portfolio company needs it? Um, but I assume that you're making an investment not because you're necessarily expecting it to thrive on its own. Or maybe you are, right? You completely believe in the founder and the team and you're just deploying capital. Um, Great. Let's ask, the, let's ask the experts. Kent, what's involved? Um, well, it really depends on who the founder is and how much they need. I think um, there are some companies, you know, especially great companies that very rapidly, maybe they start with an incredible team or they very rapidly attract an incredible experienced team. And then they need less and less of your help on the day to day. I mean, first of all, I could not help anyone day to day. I, I've never run a deli, much less a, a startup. So, you know, I sit on the board and can advise on these bigger sort of financing questions, strategy, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to the day-to-day -day ops, the best companies very quickly become independent of their board on day-to-day -day, or else you have a huge problem because, good Lord, right? They need, they, you need a bit, the CEOs themselves need to become irrelevant to the operations of the company. That's sort of their job is to put in place the talent so they don't need it, and the board especially. Um, then there are these moments of big advice, big financing decisions, recruiting. Um, you know, you're trying to close a candidate for some senior role where the board, I think, can be really involved and helpful. You're certainly recruiting people from your network to join the company, but that's really easy because you're like, wow, this company's amazing. You should check it out. Um, and so that, the companies are very grateful when you introduce them to great people, but it's like an email. It's a very easy thing to do. A lot of firms will talk about much more hands-on operating advice. Like, I'm going to run a bunch of sales ops for you and get you a bunch of customers. I just don't think that scales, ultimately. I think that's more, honestly, of a sales tactic for a lot of those firms than it is a true, you know, edge post investment um, that they can scale. And for example, just to make sure that you hear both sides of it, I don't know whether that's right or it's wrong. I happen to agree with it. But Andreessen would say, no, 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 no. That's the whole thing we bring is the talent group that can come in and help you with all these different things and will make all these introductions, etc. Seems to work great for them. So there's no right or wrong here. Uh, but there is a thread here that I want to draw out, which is uh, and I, I thought you said it beautifully, Kent, which is if you've got a really talented team, the last thing you want is to be in their way. You actually ought to be kicked out by them. So this is happening real time. I'm actually kicking myself off the board of a $130 million company because I've never run a $150 million company going to 500 million. It's just not my skill set. So I'm putting in somebody who I did back who took a business from 100 to a billion one. He's going to be much better at that. So you actually need to think about it that way, because also you don't want to be on every single board of every company investing, because you'll soon run out of time. So this is a very interesting part of what people disagree on in the venture world. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask Melody if you've got a viewpoint in between that, between, yeah, we want to add value, but no, we don't want to get in the way. Where, where do you come out in NextView? First, we tell founders that they build companies. We don't build companies. And the way I frame how we are helpful is one, we try to be there to be a very intentional thought partner. And, and I say intentional because our model is we, we have, we're pretty top heavy as a seed firm. So we have five partners and that allows us each to only take on, you know, two to four new investments a year. And, you know, as a result, like we can be very intentional about these are the five companies I'm constantly thinking about. So I'm, I can be very proactive and hopefully the quality of the conversations that we have are good. And so it's less about these like tactical things, in my opinion, that, in which we all do a lot. We like, we do very like ground level stuff, like reaching out to VP of marketing hires um, personally to see if we can, you know, have better conversion of those candidates and, and, and do stuff like that. But um, I honestly think because the founder journey, especially at the pre-product market fit stage is, very, very up and down and very lonely and very psychologically draining. You kind of just want someone you can trust that can bounce ideas off and you come out of that one hour conversation. Hopefully, you know, because we're not in the weeds as much, but we have a lot of context of the company and the team that we can 
bounce something back that they, they come out and say, oh, this is a really interesting way to look at this important topic or decision for the company. Um, but, you know, I tell, I tell founders, like, you guys have a thousand decisions to make, and hopefully you have the ability to, to like, prioritize the 10 that you bring to this conversation, and hopefully we can help save time. And, like, I don't, I think about, like, I don't know if people can see my hand, but, like, we don't, we don't profoundly change the trajectory of the business, but we can probably lift the probability curve a little bit by saving them some time, which is actually really important at the C stage. Okay, so thank you. Um, first of all, for giving that, because it's a lovely balanced viewpoint that you're talking about. You feel like you can clearly make a difference, but you're not claiming that you're going to make the company successful or not. And most VCs will somewhere find their sort of balance between thinking they're geniuses that build companies or quite the opposite. They're just lucky enough to invest in entrepreneurs. I fall in the category of, by the way, I don't have a job without an entrepreneur. And I feel like if I'm not lucky enough to back the right entrepreneur, that's my problem. What I loved is that uh, Michelle, Ala, and Radhika wrote down one word, which is influence. It's probably the only word that I want to just expand on. So Ala, you haven't had a chance to talk. What did you mean by influence? Well, I guess as a VC, you have a lot of experience, and presumably a lot of VCs have their own sector expertise. Um, otherwise, I'm not really sure what value would be adding to particular companies. So if you think that a founder or a team is going down a wrong path, or you can like redirect them. And I think that's pretty valuable and probably why a lot of early, like very early stage, the 10,000 minus 2,000 times 300 that don't get funded probably end up dying. Um, sometimes people just need a little bit of advice or a little bit of advice or something that they don't know. Um, Great. Have you watched Paul Mader's podcast yet? Okay, so this is why we're doing the podcast. And again, thank you, uh, Keanu. We want to get lots of opinions. Paul Mader would 100% agree with you. And on some level, he would say the only reason VC exists is because people believe they can get advice or counsel or influence from people that have done it before. So he gives a very interesting example. And I'll let you listen to it. But look out for a, a guy called Paul Severino, who was a billionaire, but he still came back and raised money from VCs. And go listen to it and ask why. And then you'll hear the role that we play in this. And by the way, it's not the answer. I'm going to keep emphasizing this to you. There's many different ways to do VC. That's why this is such an apprenticeship business. And it also depends very much on where you go and what stage. All right, just because of time, I'm going to move on from building unless uh, Alex, well, actually, let me ask the class. Do you guys feel like you've got enough of a sense of building? Again, in the relative scheme. Julius, go ahead. I just, since we spent a lot of time on selecting and also sourcing a little bit, yeah. I'm just curious how much time, how, how you guys allocate your time between looking for new deals and actually being involved? Great question. Kent, how much time do you spend between those two? I'd say this is, um, unfortunately, 30% of my time these days. Uh, unfortunately, I say because I think it's where all the alpha creation happens, honestly. So selection through winning. Yep. And then um, the sort of board work is, I'm, in, I'm on 16 boards. So um, it's a lot of my time, and I, I love it, and I love working with those founders. But it, but it sort of creeps into the time you can use to do research and find the next great company. So it's it, at some level it becomes a tax on your time, even though it's um, it's kind of the most fun <laughs> because you love these teams, um, and the exiting is tiny. I mean that's you know ten days a year tops on a good year. So this is like seventy percent of your time. Yeah. So by the way, I know that Alex is going to get a different answer, so I just have to ask it. I know you're also at a very different stage of your career, but how much do you spend, relatively speaking? I'm actually not too dissimilar from, from, from Ken. Between 105 companies, not all of them are alive, from my tech stars five-year tenure to 30-plus um, deals I did at 2040 Adventures. I, I'm definitely feeling like a lot of my time is going into portfolio. That said, I only do it one day a week. I only do it on Wednesdays, like is when I meet companies and it's just back to back to back. Uh, so I don't really take board seats. I take board observer and it's a very different style of engagement, but I do meet most of the companies that are active um, every three weeks for about 30 minutes. Great. Melody, quick answer just for time. Percentage on the front end versus building. 
probably 40% on the front end. Um, but I also caught one thing that we didn't talk about in terms of time management is like firm building. <laughs> we we have venture firms that we're building and there's, I'm, I was just looking at my calendar because I color code my calendar like a crazy person. So I kind of get a sense of what I'm doing. And there's a lot of time just like firm stuff. Yep. So those of us who are building firms, um, who've started them, that would definitely bring both of you into it. I, I know that you aren't literally a founder, but you're still are building a firm. We all have time that we have to put into actually running the firm, building the firm, recruiting the next part of partner on the team, et cetera, uh, or mentoring you know, principals, et cetera. That is a huge part of it. It just brings up something, I'm trying to do it right now, which is one of the best skills you can learn is time management because there's never enough time. In fact, I'll just tell you one thing that LPs judge you on is how good you are with time management. If you spent all your time on the deals that are failing, instead of optimizing the ones that are, have the potential for huge outcomes, you will fail to win the game of the power law, which is the book that we've all encouraged you to read. So what you realize in this business pretty quickly is it doesn't matter where you spend your time, you need to be very selective about it and very thoughtful and very mindful of specifically what you're trying to get out of it. All right. Um, Great question, though. Thank you. Before we move on from build, Julius, anything else? Did that answer your question? Yeah, go ahead in the back, Allah. Yeah, I actually have a question about the time management um, on the sourcing end. So I, th I think like there's a lot of research that shows that these, most of DC funding still goes to white males. And I think a part of that is probably because of the networking, which I think leveraging the network is a good way of managing your time. But at the same time, how do you fix the gaps in your um, which ultimately exists. Yeah. Um, and I guess, yeah, so I'd be curious to hear how you guys think about that. Well, first of all, one of the reasons we're running this class is to fix this issue. Because if we can change the dynamic and give everybody equal access to becoming part of the venture network, then you can decide who you invest in. And you will change it from being white males who are predominantly, in the historic sense, the uh, people who've been both controlling this investment uh, cycle, but also building those networks. And the more diverse that we get the VC population, the more likely we are to get you investing in building networks that are diverse, that therefore brings much more diverse investment opportunities. So I think the answer is not today a solution that we can just present. It's something we have to develop over generations to come. But thank you for raising it. Anybody got any more questions on building? The exiting bit's going to be quick. Yes, Stella. Um, I think I'm just trying to wrap my head around like how you're adding your value, your winning value. In the sense that, like, Kent, you mentioned that you spend 70% of your time building. If you have 50 weeks in a year, that means you're spending 35 weeks in a year working with the companies, and yet you're giving them advice. You're sitting in on board meetings, which honestly happens, like, once every quarter, uh, typically. So I, I suppose, I guess I'm confused on, like, how deep do you go? Because you're not doing tactical work. You're doing strategy. So, like, wh what level of depth do you go? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's um, if these companies, you've got, <laughs> not to add it up, but four, boarding, four board meetings a year, right? Um, that's kind of a half day meeting. Um, plus, every major decision they face, they're going to check in with you and have a conversation. Plus, you may have some standing update call every two weeks, times 16. Ends up being a ton of time. Um, and so, at the beginning of your career, you have none of it, and you have all that free time. You're, you know, again, it's not going to be like what, uh, you know, what hand soap should we get in the in the bathroom? But like a ma any major hiring decision is going to be a conversation. Um, so, and I'd say, in two thirds of those conversations, you're not maybe adding any value. You're saying that sounds, you know, a great entrepreneur is telling you they're, what they're going to do. You're saying that sounds great. In a third of them, you're saying. You should talk to this person about that, you know, because I, I know somebody in my network who might have an edge. So there's value added there, but it's 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 not as efficient <laughs> of a use of time as the, as that moment you meet the brand new portfolio company that's going to be the next, you know, Pinterest or whatever. Anna, I just had a quick question. Um, so given that there's usually multiple investors involved in a round, I guess how does what does that mean for building? How how closely do you work together? Like, do you have to be aligned? Does, like, or is it just like, oh, if you're the lead investor, then you have more say? And, yeah. Typically, there's going to be one lead investor in a round. 
and typically that person will be the you know the board member say and will be the most influential not always sometimes you have an observer who shows up at it with a small piece but is like a super credible former operator and it's going to have huge impact and huge influence so it's the influence word is you kind of can't have everybody be the most influential so you pretty quickly it sorts itself out on whose voice is going to be louder in that room and that's that's you that's not always a positive thing right because sometimes the loudest voice in the room is we've all been in an HBS classroom like not the best voice in the room you're like all right we heard you um so um but uh but it tends to sort itself out Anna um Alex um on the theme of timing i've heard that is typically a major source of tension between the VCs and the founders and that the VCs um have certain obligations to their LPs and need the VCs to hit certain performance metrics um and the founders can sometimes deliver can't deliver and ultimately results in potentially a tense relationship um can you speak to how you've managed that and worked through um those conversations with your founders yeah i i think at the pre-seed stage um it doesn't really take place i think complexity really arises much later when you may you know as an as a vc you may realize that the founder isn't scaling so i i stay involved and i'll be the first in line to say you know i'm giving you a hug but i think it's time for for, for you to move on um i think that it it it's a, it's a very difficult thing for most founders to understand that they're not scaling i genuinely had not had a ton of experience with that i i i would guess that can't probably uh you know can't get to do a lot more of it so maybe pass it to him it it being like how do you move things on or yeah i mean I, again i think if you're if you're direct with people this conversation is not a hard one it, it's you know if you're working with rational founders is it working or not is it working and and you know i can get into the weeds of how that you define that but when it is working you're not confused it's working when it's not working you're not confused it's not working occasionally it's on the borderline 10% of the time like oh, we don't know if it's working or not and then you got a bank balance and it's running down and so it it tends to focus the conversation not always cuz you can sometimes be at odds but and we're aligned like bessemer's model is to invest in companies that you know we love all the companies but some small share of them are going to have outsized incredible outcomes for the rest of them i love the founders and entrepreneurs i work with and i don't want them to spend the next 10 years of their lives banging their heads against a wall like that's not good for them it's not good for our lps it's not good for anyone so we t- tend to be very aligned on those conversations it's tricky when you disagree on reality you know and you have two versions of reality but that's pretty rare if you invest in people who are you know pretty reasonable um and the last thing i'll say is if you're inv- if you your investor has such a stake in your outcome that their next fund could depend on it you are in a bad spot and so you don't want to be you know as as one of their investments you don't want to be so material like they're writing the biggest check they've ever written that it has to go right that's not a good feeling now if you're incredibly successful and all of a sudden you are going to drive the future of their fund they may have some ideas about what you, you want to do but you know you're on top of the world then so it doesn't matter what they want i mean if they could be like let's go public next year you'll be like be quiet we're going to be fine <laughs> you know so it tends to work itself out unless you you are getting someone to really step outside of their lane and their lps are nervous about the investment that do not be there yeah go ahead at the back oh i was going to ask like just broadly like if you could pick one part of this that you hate doing like which one would it be melody you haven't spoken in a while what what part of this do you not like uh writing past emails yep writing past emails so what's the number one reason you say no and these are quick one word answers melody market not big enough okay kent uh i don't think the product has enough of an advantage okay alex the team is not good enough okay we got the perfect trifectas of answers there but by the way everybody hates doing this i can't tell you how flooded my inbox is with emails that i know i just i'm never going to invest in i'll tell you a little stat because it's interesting so i was part of a fund that got to be 3 and 1/2 billion dollars and not a single investment we made in the 12 years that i was there was made from a cold inbound not one 
Now, that might have been a mistake. Maybe we, we missed the next great Facebook. But uh, we spend an inordinate amount of time doing that. What's the number one you, reason you say yes, Alex? The team. Consistent. OK, Melody? I mean, I, I would say the team, but you know, I guess I'll say the market. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Uh, Kent? Product market fit. PMF, great. OK, so you can see how people go. OK, what's the, the um, number of, of uh, deals that you lose as a percentage or win as a percentage? Actually, let's put it in the positive, in the win as a percentage. Uh, Kent? I probably win 85%. Alex? Same, maybe 80. Melody? 84.3. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. So how many years on average are you invested in a company, Ken? I looked at this once, and across our firm, the whole time was seven and a half years. But it's a lot of quick. It's a, that's brought down by some two, three, four year holds and a lot of 10, 11, 12 year holds to IPO. What's your average now? It's probably like seven to 10. Okay, seven to 10. Uh, Alex? I'm too young and too oh. short of a career in venture to even measure this. Well, it's very honest of you to say that, but you've actually done very well so far, so. All right, how many, I, how many exits have you had, Kent? Uh, for, <laughs> what kind of exits? Well, no, no, it could be all exits. Like, <laughs> All exits, uh, 40. 40, OK. And how many of them would you consider to be a success? Uh, it depends how you measure up. I'd say you know, we made a positive return in half, probably. And what would you say, OK, real winners that I'm just thrilled with? Maybe six of them. Six, OK. And that's why we all want you to read this Power Law book, because Kent's an extremely successful investor at an extremely successful fund. But six out of 10,000 that he's potentially going to have a look at. That's why this is such a tough business. Now, he didn't really spend time on all 10,000. But 300 that got down to the, the yeah, you know. It's 100,000. Yeah, exactly. By the time over years. That's sake. right. Thank you for reminding me. It's, yeah. it's literally you look at hundreds of thousands. I can't remember how many uh, decks I had in my uh, uh, inbox at one stage, but it was just in that one week, something that made me reflect, God, if I got this every week, I would never get out of just the saying no Pete, piece of this business. Alex, do you want to say how many you've had exits? Yeah, of course. So I'm just looking out of my 105 Dexter's companies, eight had uh, substantial exits. Eight wins, great. And congrats, Melody? Don't, don't, uh, don't answer if you don't want to, by the way. Yeah, I mean, personally, you know, just for context, personally, I've done maybe like a dozen investments, maybe 15 tops for next few, and one died and the rest of them are still going. So like, I've, this stuff takes a long time. <laughs> That's the seven to 10 year point. And you really don't know if you're any good at it for 10 years. And the reason is that if it takes seven to 10 years for them to come out, you need to be successful multiple times before you can say it wasn't just pure luck. So yeah, you might get lucky and have a great win. But to get six in a row, that means you're a good investor. Uh, anyway, I hope you now have a sense of investing. We didn't spend any time on exiting because Kent told you why. Actually, that takes care of itself, with one exception, which is on the basis of time management, you do not want to spend time on things that are dead, meaning the market's disappeared, or the team's given up, or there really isn't any opportunity to make the breakthrough that you thought you first invested in. We actually have a very simple matrix. I'll give it to you just so that it's you know, kind of my why we don't spend a lot of time on exiting, which is after having 102 portfolio companies in a fund, I finally said, OK, there's really only one thing we need to look at, which is performance versus potential. And if they're all high potential companies that are performing well, that's pretty obvious. You just keep running them. The ones that you really need to watch out for are the ones that their performance is down here and their potential is down here. If they're performing badly and the potential's gone, this is not where you want to spend your time. It's why it becomes important to think about how to exit. By the way, it might not be physically exit, because you actually have to be a good investor, I mean, to the, the founders, but you don't want to spend all your time on those kinds of low potential, low performance companies. The ones that have high potential that are not performing, 
That's where you want to spend time to try to get them up there. That's where your influence can make a big difference in the building piece. The, the ones that are over here that are interesting, uh, you can say there's no potential, but they're performing well. What do you do with those? Julius? Change the market or the idea? Like yeah, you could pivot. Mark? I was going to say the same thing. Redirect them towards something where they can have higher potential. Yeah. Well, what else might you do? Yeah, Eric? Sell them. Sell them, yeah. There's all sorts of reasons why that piece actually becomes a, a place where you exit. I sold three companies in our first portfolio within the first, I think, it was six years. One, because the founder literally had a nervous breakdown. Very awkward. Super nice guy. He's still doing great things, but not in that high potential uh, mode. Another, because the competitor came in and acquired the number one other competitor we had and just basically claimed the space. And the founders all realized that they'd be much better off selling to the number two player. They got a great outcome. And the third, because one of our portfolio companies approached the founders and said, hey, we could make this 10 times bigger if you use our distribution channels. And so we said, great, that's a good combo, win-win. Everybody does great. And in fact, we've got a 6x on that investment after exiting it and continuing in the company that's now about a $330 million business. So lots of reasons why exit's important. But again, you're going to learn a lot of that at HBS. Uh, you're going to get all the case studies and examples of this. So it wasn't really what I wanted to get into tonight. So I just want to say a very big thank you to Kent and to Melody and to Alex for being such great guests here. And uh, welcome to uh, the real world of venture that you heard three such different perspectives. We really appreciate you bringing your brain into this.